You are tuned to the Nighttime Podcast, focused on the fringe of Canada. How's it going, Aaron? Good, buddy. How are you? I'm doing, uh, well, I'm doing weird. Uh, This uh, coronavirus thing is still making life uh, more interesting than I like it to be, but it's, uh, I guess this is the new normal. Yeah, I think that both of us uh, try to stay away from trouble, and seems like the outside world is filled with trouble right now. Yeah, both the kind you can see and can't see, so mm-hmm. I guess uh, I- I'm under my stairs in my basement now in uh, a padded room, so this is probably this is a good place to be right now. Yeah, I'm in a padded room, but it's upstairs and very exposed. Yeah, so I feel like I'm getting getting coronavirus as we speak (laughs) well let's hope not uh because we need to get through this episode we got it we got a weird one to talk about today this story is one where when i first started the show i had like a list of 20 or 30 topics that i was hoping to cover Uh, a lot of them were set in nova scotia this was one of them and i just never got around to it for for a few reasons but the big one being it's just so dark and tragic and sad. And anytime I kind of started the, the research and reading about it and whatnot, I just like I almost had to look away because it was just too much. So I guess this will be kind of a, a warning for the listeners to um, to be cautious going into this one because this is a heavy story. D- did you know much about this before I asked you to uh, look into it with me? Uh, yeah, I remember when it happened. Um you know, being uh, from the the area, well, you know, close to the area where where mm-hmm. it all took place. So I remember it was a pretty big news story when it broke, and and uh, it really um, affected the entire island, um, and oh, yeah. and probably the province too, in a lot of ways. Uh, it, yeah, even it, it affected people across the world. This this story is so unique and so bizarre that. And when you say it made news, like it made news locally in Cape Breton and in Nova Scotia and across Canada, but this was a news story around the world. When you when you Google Taylor Mitchell's name, the the young woman involved in the story, you'll find articles in German and uh, different Asian languages. Like this was talked about all over the world because it's so unique and so horrific, basically. Right, and I didn't realize that. Because I kind of thought this was more of a provincial story and even more so uh, a Cape Breton Island story. And I didn't realize that it rippled so far across the world. Mm-hmm. When we get into it, we'll, you'll, you'll see why, because this is unique. But let's kind of start at the beginning. Before we get into the, the tragedy that ended her life, let's talk a bit about Taylor Mitchell. Uh, of course, I nor you, I'm sure, have ever met her, but she's very much someone we would have crossed paths with uh, in her in her younger years. Like one, she was in Cape, she was originally from Toronto, but mm-hmm. she was in Cape Breton to perform. She was a, a on tour as a musician traveling uh, Eastern Canada. Um, she had died just before her planned concert at Maxwell's in Sydney. I don't think we, we played in a band together, but I don't think we ever played at Maxwell's, did we? Not as um not as a band. I played there a number of times um solo and mm-hmm. I went there a lot too. Um I'm I'm sure you've been there a few times. Oh yeah. Yeah. And uh and it, dude, there was a good chance I would have been at her concert because yeah, the, on the weekend that was, the, that was a that was a pretty regular spot that we would go. Yeah, that was the era that we were around there. And this would have been late October of 2009. She was scheduled to play at Maxwell's Mm -hmm. and never showed up. And basically the news then spread that she had died tragically, you know, the day before the the planned concert. And, And just like you said, it's like I've seen a lot of people just like taylor mitchell who came through sydney as as uh, as touring musicians so it's when i when i learned about this story and learned about taylor's life and in her history and her and her art i just felt a bit of a connection because she's very much the type of person that i would have connected with so let, let's talk a bit about her 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 st- taylor mitchell is what we'll call her but that's actually a stage name her her real name or her birth name was was taylor lucio 
she comes from a artistic family in Toronto. Her parents apparently were really into music and the arts. They saw to it that she would go to a uh, to an art school. It was called the uh, Etobicoke School of the Arts, and she majored in musical theater, which is very much uh, up your alley. That's that's kind of your thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it, it's while in you know going to school there and pursuing you know musical theater, she started to dabble more in the singer songwriter style of artwork, and that's when she took on the last name Mitchell. I, I can only guess that it's to. You know, a, a a tip of the hat to like maybe Joni Mitchell. That's is, where that's where my mind went with it. Um, but I was going to ask if you officially knew. Um, no, I, it it I would be shocked if it wasn't just because the style of music that that Taylor played was it very much seemed to like take inspiration from like a Joni Mitchell, right? Um, and I did hear an, an interview with her where she was listing some of her. Um, some of the people who inspired her, and she did say Joni Mitchell's name. So I'm guessing that's likely where she took the stage name Mitchell. But regardless, she was she's known now and forever will be known as uh, as Taylor Mitchell. Um, as as far as her music career, which is what brought her to Sydney and what kind of set up the situation, which would lead to to her death. Um, she she found a musical collaborator in a vocal coach she had. His name was his name is Michael Johnson. Uh, initially, again, their relationship was he was the vocal coach, helping her learn to you know master her craft of singing. Right. Um, he helped her record an EP, like a short album, in two thousand and seven. But he saw the amount of promise that she had as a as a performer and a singer and songwriter, and it seems like he kind of took her under his wing, and he eventually would go on to produce her debut album, her only album, which is the one that she was basically on tour promoting it's called um it's called for your consideration did did you get a chance to check out any of her music i actually didn't to be honest i thought about it and then you know cuz I, I i wasn't familiar at all with her music mm-hmm. and i thought about listening to it and i just didn't get a chance to get around to it so i i, di- yeah. I didn't actually sit down and listen yeah well it it's really good she's as far as like a, a singer she has incredible chops like she's I think she recorded that album when she was 19. It's very much country, pop country, pop folk country style of music. She can sing like um, like anything, like it's nobody's business. And the album is, um, f- again, called For Your Consideration. You can find songs and whatnot on YouTube and see performances, uh, recorded performances of her on YouTube. Th- the album sounds pretty awesome. She had... Um, this uh, the the producer put together a band to back her up, and the band is pretty much an all star kind of band. It's um, people from there was a, a musician who who played with Ani DeFranco, some uh, a guy who backed up Ron Sexsmith, the Jim Cuddy band. So it's you know seasoned professional musicians worked with her on this album, and in the end, when you listen to it. It it sounds like something if you played it on you know the the country radio station it would fit right in and you right. know and, and a lot of people saw this like Taylor Mitchell in life uh, right after the release of that album was receiving basically universal acclaim people who heard the album loved it loved her singing loved her performance and people said things like her her voice and her lyrics just kind of transcended her age and you know spoke to um a a more intelligent mind than you would expect from you know a 19 year old singer songwriter so it's this isn't the story of just an average person who died tragically this is the story of of an up-and-coming musician who really had the chance to be you know a mainstream major major artist and basically as soon as her album was released and she hit the road to promote it her life was ended in you know the most horrific way that i think you could even imagine yeah and she was young when she recorded that album because i mean when she was 19 when she died and so what would she have been 17 when she recorded that album I, I think she would I think 18 I think she recorded it not long after that went on tour and when she mm-hmm. was 19 had had passed away I think she I could be could be wrong but I think she had turned 19 shortly before shortly she, before uh, yeah. she hit the tour but to give an idea it's like 
of, of her age and maturity and whatnot. Although it's it's different for everybody, but she had just got her license, got a car, and hit the road on tour alone, which is it kind of speaks to her independence. Like for, to go from Toronto to get your license, buy a car, and then drive to Eastern Canada alone to you know perform at at bars and nightclubs and whatnot. That that alone is pretty – that would be pretty intimidating for a young woman or for a young man or anyone for that matter. Absolutely. I didn't get my license until I was 29. And I remember the first time I even drove to Halifax, which is like a four- or five-hour drive. <laughs> and I was like, I'm such an adult right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, she uh, – I guess it it speaks to her confidence in, in her art. And she – really felt and a lot of people around her felt like she had something special to offer and you know this tour was maybe going to be the the first steps in a in a career as a as a musician and as a performing artist she was actually just as she started the tour she found out that she was nominated for um, a Canadian folk music award she got uh, nominated for young performer of the year um, as a result of her release of that of that album for your consideration. So it was basically the, as a 19 year old releasing their debut album, going on tour, receiving an award. You can only imagine that this would have been a very exciting time and a very optimistic time for her with life ahead of her. But as we'll get into things, um, things don't turn out that way. The, the tour that she was she was planning, this may not mean a lot to the people listening who aren't from the area, but basically she started in Ottawa playing at a house party, and this is October 19th of 09. From there, she drove to New Brunswick with two stops. She played at a Bridge Street Cafe in Sackville, New Brunswick, a place called the Broadway Cafe in Sussex, New Brunswick, and then... Her final t her final performance was in a town called Lucasville, Nova Scotia, which is it's just that's actually just outside of Halifax. But she played there, and some perform some audio and video of the performance is on YouTube, and it's quite eerie to watch it um, being her last performance and knowing the way her tour would end. But in that performance, she spoke about how. Her next show was in our hometown in Sydney at a place called Maxwell's, but she had, I think it was a day or two days off. So she would do the show in Lucasville, have a day or two off, and then have the show in, in Sydney. The way she decided to spend her time is on that day off. is She wanted to visit a hiking trail. Uh, she's very outdoorsy. She was rode animal rode horses as a hobby and actually before she got into music the, to the extent that she did she had ambitions to possibly make a career out of caring for and riding horses but anyway she's very much an outdoorsy type loves nature and loves animals in cape breton where we where we're from there's this area called the highlands which is a, kind of a mountainous area i guess is how i would call it very rural very forested full of waterfalls and walking trails and nature preserves. But one of the places, maybe even the crown jewel of the Highlands, is a, a walking trail called the Skyline Trail, which is a trail that, as you walk it, it's basically a big loop, but in the middle of the loop, there's kind of a, um, I guess I would just call it a uh, sort of like a bridge or a boardwalk, except you're not on the water, you're like up in a mountain and you're overlooking um, I think it's Bay St. Lawrence. So from, from the Skyline Trail, when you're on this boardwalk, you can kind of look down, see the water, and maybe even see whales. I I'm sure you've been – I don't know if you've been on Skyline Trail, but I'm sure you've spent time in the Highlands, Aaron. Oh, yeah. Every, every summer we, we go up and we, you know, we, we pick a trail to go on and we uh, do kind of the, you know, kind of staycation touristy thing. But that – spot that you talk about with the boardwalk like when you google images of the skyline trail like that's the spot that everybody takes their pictures at so mm -hmm. you see a lot of selfies from from this spot and uh you know numerous other spots on the skyline trail but it's a really popular trail and it's one that uh everybody recommends to do yeah it's i've been on it in I've been on it before this this event happened that we're talking about now, and I I would feel pretty weird going on it now. But I remember being on it and just being blown away because it's like when you're up that high, 
on the trail and you're just looking down at the water and over the tree. It's just a, it's a beautiful spot. The the whole highlands are beautiful. It's there's it's very natural. Like there's a lot of animals and birds and streams and rivers and lakes and water. And it's just when people say Cape Breton Island is a beautiful place. They're not necessarily talking about the parts of Cape Breton that you and I are from. They're more so talking about places like the Skyline Trail. So yes. it's, you know, this is among the most beautiful places in Canada. So for someone like Taylor Mitchell coming from Ontario, this is the kind of trail that that she would want to go to, to see Cape Breton's beauty and kind of our our version of the of the natural world um, as it exists in, in Cape Breton. And it's it's not known as a dangerous place. It's I, th I believe the majority of the trail, you can even make it in a wheelchair like um, it's it's the walkway is like kind of like a gravelish kind of sandy kind of thing that that you can get through. So it's not like it's a difficult hike up a mountainside or anything like that. You basically drive to a parking lot get out, you walk up an access road, then you get on the trail system, which is basically a, a big loop where in the middle of the loop, you walk across the boardwalk with that scenic view that we talked about. But that trail, for people who know this story, uh, I don't think they'll ever look at it the same. So I guess we should, uh, we should get into the, the darker side of the story. Had, as we had already alluded to, is, is Taylor is traveling alone on her day off, late October, fall, a beautiful time of year to do this. She decides to go to this trail and, and do the walk alone. And it's easy to understand why. If you're you know, a, a folk singer with a love for nature, this is, again, the place you want to be, the kind of place you want to you wanna check out when you're in, in Cape Breton. She arrives at the Skyline Trail at about 2.30 p.m. that afternoon. She parks her car, she walks up the access road, which is a gravel road, to get onto the actual trail. She's walking through the trail, and as she's walking through the trail, she passes a pair of, uh, of hikers from the United States. They're leaving as she's going in. So she crosses paths with them, and she kind of like, you know, apparently they, they spoke to the press quite a bit. And what I've heard is they like said hi and nodded at each other and, you know, just did that friendly thing you do when you pass someone on a trail. Right. Uh, and they kept walking. And that ends up being the last time Taylor's ever, you know, seen in, in good shape, right. is, is how I'll, I'll put it. Those, those hikers. Do you want to talk about what what they what alerted them to a problem? Because that's kind of the next step in this. Basically, after I'm not sure exactly how um, long after, but um, I, just it was about 20 minutes after they yeah, passed Taylor. They, they about 20 minutes later, they heard um, no like screaming noises coming from uh, back in the trail. So. And, and it wasn't like a normal kind of, you know, screaming or, or, or noises that they were hearing, that they were hearing. It was something definitely different that alerted them that, that something uh, potentially bad was, was happening uh, back in the trail. Yeah, I heard it, them describe it as it didn't necessarily sound like an animal. It didn't necessarily sound human. It was just howling and screaming and and you know like when you hear kids messing around and they scream that's one sound but when you hear like terror in someone's voice that type of shriek that's that's different and and that's what they heard immediately they thought of the young woman they had just passed in the, you know 15 or 20 minutes earlier but what they did was um by the time they heard it they were on that access road off of the path going towards the parking lot. So this couple basically ran up ahead to get to the parking lot where there was a pay phone. And when they got there, they picked up a phone, called 911 to basically say something something is wrong. There's someone or something just screaming bloody murder in the trail and you know, you need to get out here and check it out. Um a few minutes later, as they were waiting for the cops to respond, they, this couple standing by the phone, by their car, waiting for the police to arrive, they see, um, 
a, another group coming up to go into the trail. It was a group of of tourists. I think they were Australian. Yeah, four that's of them. Uh, in one of the documentaries that that I saw. They, I think they they had an accent that was an Australian accent that mm-hmm. um, in the interview. So it seemed like yeah, they were from Australia. At least one or two of them were anyway. Yeah, and they um, the Americans basically approached them and said, explained what had happened. And this group of four, uh, Australia, they were from Europe and Australia. They they basically ran in to investigate. They, I believe they could hear it as well still at this point. And they ran up the path to try to see what was going on and, you know, to offer help if they could. Um, so the story from now will kind of follow these four tourists the running up the trail, like up the access road into the trail to try to see what's going on. As they're running, they start seeing things that make it obvious that something is wrong. They first find um, in the middle of the path a set of keys just sitting in the in the open in the middle of the path. A few steps further, they find a camera. There's also a small pocket knife. And these are all just, you know, a couple steps apart. They still don't hear anything. They're just finding these things. And it's, you know, they're they're out of place. So it's obvious something's wrong. But as they get a bit closer, and, and at this point, they're all yelling, like, is anyone there? Does anyone need help? Mm-hmm. They end up finding, I believe, bloody pieces of clothing is what really alerts them that something's wrong. They found, they see blood on the tracks and see a little bit of clothing. I don't know what it was, if it was a piece of a shirt or what, but there was some kind of piece of bloody clothing. And at the point that they found that, they realized that they're standing near a, like an outhouse. Like it's a small building on the trail that you could go into to use the bathroom or something like that. Uh, well, yeah, they, they would a, have these things like, I don't know, every 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 so often down a long trail, there's going to be yeah. kind of a, an outhouse type uh, bathroom to go into. Yeah, it's a little bathroom with maybe like a sink and a toilet or something. But as they get close they, they and they see this building, they realize that there's, you know, blood smeared on the on the front door. And that's when, I wouldn't say panic hit them, but that's when they're realizing they're likely approaching, you know, like a murder scene. And they're probably thinking, you know, is there some guy out here with an axe or a chainsaw or something? Because that's kind of what it sounds like and what it feels like they're walking into. And that would be like a a pretty brave thing for them to be doing, you know, kind of going in down this trail, you know, finding these items. Like, I can't imagine how freaked out they must have been or were they working off of adrenaline or like, you know, especially when they see, you know, blood on this like uh, outhouse style uh, outdoor bathroom. And, and it just mm-hmm. looks like it almost like a scene from Friday the 13th or something. Oh, it absolutely does. But I can't imagine it to be adrenaline because they don't know, like, it's not like they know what's even going on. To me, it seems more like they're following kind of a mystery. If they had heard, you know, these brutal screams and whatnot, maybe they'd be like, oh, my God, someone needs help. And they'd be running to help. But in their case, they're just like, what is going on here? And they're finding the camera and, you know, and slowly kind of creeping up so I, I think it's at about this point that they're like whoa like we just stumbled into something that's dead serious like you know what do we do yeah yeah because i mean they're told going in like you know there's something bad's going down something's going down in there we heard screams whatever they're finding these items like i, I even at finding the items i'd be pretty freaked out like not knowing what they could possibly be walking into yeah. and then as soon as you see the blood on the bathroom and and the trail of ripped clothing and blood and everything like i'd be i'd be pretty scared at this point at this point i would and i can't emphasize as much uh, uh, enough how remote this is like if you're out in, in on the skyline trail and you're in a bad situation like if you even get cell phone reception, because I, I don't know if you can even get cell phone reception out there, know. but if you can and you call like the local police, it's, you know, you're probably calling some guy at his house who's going to like get in his truck and drive out there. Like that's probably about the extent of, of their police department out there. And it's, it may be a 15, 20 minute drive for him to even get to you. So it's, you know, this would be the kind of place that I would be at this point, I would be freaked out. Uh, they realize there's a problem. 
they then start saying like, hello, hello, is, you know, is there anyone there? They're probably thinking there's somebody in there that they're going to find a body or something or walk into the scene. But rather than hearing someone answer their, their calls, what they hear is almost just like a, a vague kind of cry or, or whimper come from the bushes, uh, like kind of the, the, the edge of the forest kind of to the, to the side of this little outhouse. Um, when they look in the direction that they hear this cry come from, they find the source of the blood. They see Taylor Mitchell, 19 year old woman. She's laying on the ground um, in a horrible state, um, covered in blood. And standing over her is a roughly 40 pound coyote, which is, um, and, and that coyote is just standing over her, staring coldly at these four Australians, almost like the way they describe this, the coyote's um, body language is basically like, I'm not leaving this scene like it's either like they it, he's not taking off the coyote's not scared in any way of them is no. the way they describe it he's basically standing there ready to fight it out with them if they're going to try to take her away from him and these aren't this isn't like a scrawny little coyote this to me the impression i have is that it's a big gnarly you know intimidating coyote it's not i think some people and i know myself maybe uh back in the day you know had a picture in my mind of a coyote mm -hmm. as being like a small kind of skinny look, looking little little animal but they can they can get pretty big can't they oh yeah and this is especially in like the highlands of cape breton these are tough they, these can be tough animals this coyote in particular that was standing over taylor was uh, 42 pounds and if you like a, a 42 pound dog is is a big dog and i can only imagine that this thing is pure muscle um so it's it's strong and it's would be horrifying to see it with its face covered in blood standing over her hardly even able to cry out for help at this point because she's likely been alone with this coyote or coyotes for several minutes before they arrive and and find and found her basically their next step is to try to get the coyote away from her so it, what they're doing is they're shouting at it throwing rocks and throwing sticks and the coyote's just not backing down he's not attacking her or anything he's just standing over her guarding her the way a dog would if you you know approached its bone or something like that um and and that's very unusual for a coyote they're as a general rule they're scared of humans they'll take off this one had had no fear at all when they get closer and are kind of swinging sticks at it and whatnot, what the coyote does, and they're protecting Taylor, what the coyote does is he walks maybe five or ten meters away from them, but he doesn't take off. He just kind of paces and almost walks a circle around them, still keeping Taylor in his sight and just kind of keeping them there. But he's not leaving. He's just pacing in a circle around them, coming in and out of the woods and, you know, just coldly looking at them not really making any sounds or anything, which is just the, the vision of that I find just so horrifying. I can't imagine it. But what ends up getting rid of the coyote is as this is happening, fortunately, the police officer who is responding to the call that the Americans made probably 10 or 15 minutes earlier, he arrives on the scene with a shotgun. Um, he when he approaches the coyote same thing the coyote doesn't back down he just stares the cop down uh, and the cop shoots him with a shotgun which doesn't kill the coyote it injures him and the coyote takes off into the woods and taylor's whisked away into an ambulance initially taken to uh, a hospital in um i think it was in inverness just outside of sydney yeah i thought it she... was uh, the shetta camp uh, yes yeah. that's it yeah, yeah, a, a small hospital, and she was um, to give an idea of her injuries and the the condition she's in. This will this will kind of explain it. Is 
when an ambulance shows up, there's the two paramedics in the ambulance. And generally, one paramedic will drive while the other one is in the back seat or like in the back, not the back seat, but in the back with with the patient. Like I had a, I had to go in an ambulance maybe six months ago because I had a kidney stone and I had to get an ambulance to come to my house and collect me. But that's the way it was. It was one of the paramedics drove and the other one kind of sat next to me, giving me, you know, the medicine and checking on me or whatever. In Taylor's case, she was in such bad shape that both paramedics had to be in the back with her and the police officer offered to drive the ambulance so that the way the two paramedics could be on her. And that's not typical. That's not usual. But it was she was so close to death. She was able to talk slightly when the Australian tourists were gathered around her. They asked her her name. She said Taylor. She told them she was 19. But beyond that, they uh, I, I heard one of the Australians um, explain that he stopped asking her questions because he could tell how much it was taking out of her to to answer them. So he basically just, you know, comforted her and stood with her. But they took her to the Shetty Camp Hospital in the ambulance. While there, they managed to stabilize her, giving her blood to replace the amount of blood she lost. And she was from head to toe with puncture wounds and scratches. Once she was stabilized... She was airlifted to a larger hospital. So they took her to the, the QE2 hospital in, in Halifax, which is, I, I believe, is Nova Scotia's largest hospital. They had her mother come in from Toronto. Uh, and I'm assuming that call was, you know, you got to get here right away because your daughter's in very bad shape. But sadly, uh, just after midnight, um, Taylor succumbed to her, her blood loss and her injuries and, and had passed away several hours, about six, six hours after the attack. A Toronto folk singer is dead after she was attacked by a pair of coyotes. She was hiking in the Maritimes when it happened. Her stage name was Taylor Mitchell, a 19-year-old Toronto resident who friends and former teachers say was passionate about singing and songwriting. Mitchell's promising career was cut short yesterday when she was mauled by coyotes while hiking in Cape Breton Highlands National Park. She died this morning in a Halifax hospital. Mitchell had just started an East Coast tour last week in support of her debut album. She loved the outdoors and was hiking alone when she was attacked. Another hiker heard screams and called 911. Mitchell was airlifted to a Halifax hospital, but doctors couldn't save her. Of, of course, the story of a young woman dying as a result of a coyote attack is very unique, very rare, but also it, it's just the kind of story that spreads on the news. So this very quickly became a big detail, a big deal. Yeah, it was so unheard of at the time and and people were freaked out. And I really remember specifically um, the hunting of coyotes after this, like they yeah. were, they were offering uh, more money for pelts and they were trying to, there was a lot of debate about the coyote population and if it was getting too out of control. And now there, you know, there was other reports of attacks and I don't know how, you know, uh, if the attacks actually happened or not, people started telling stories about more stories about coyotes mm -hmm. and, um, so it really, that fear started to spread a lot and just like in a, in a movie about a monster or something, the hunt started after this, like the, 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 the townspeople were coming after the coyotes. Yeah. I re I remember that happening. They, I think they called it like a calling at first. They didn't know why this happened. This is, it's so unique that Taylor's death is the only documented account of an adult being killed by a coyote. She's only the second person on record to be killed by a coyote. The other one, I believe, was a three-year-old who was killed. And that's kind of, uh, of course, tragic, but it's, it's a bit different because you can kind of imagine a young child like not being able to or, or being seen as prey to like a coyote. But for, right. uh, you know, a 19-year-old woman, it's, it's, um, this is, is pretty rare. But they didn't know, and by they, I mean society and Cape Bretoners. We, we just didn't know what led to this and i think some of the early theories going around was maybe that the coyote population is so out of control there's so many of them that maybe they were desperate for food and decided to look for you know prey and a human visiting this um this trail 
there was also there was a lot of different theories that were going around. That was one. Also, there was some kind of victim blaming sort of things going on where people were thinking that maybe Taylor was, um, you know, approached a den that the coyotes were in. And maybe there was a baby coyote and the adult attacked to as a. Uh, to defend themselves or maybe Taylor was in there trying to feed the coyotes to get close with them and you know that sort of thing so there was all these kind of ideas about what may have caused this some of them placing the blame on Taylor's behavior some of them placing the blame on the coyote population being out of control and you know and not enough food so nobody really knew what the problem was it could have been a, a rabid coyote or the coyote could have had illness or something but as the story unfolded and people began to, you know, experts began to research the behavior in, of coyotes in this area, you know, the truth slowly started to reveal itself. Now, one piece of the story I, I didn't get to and we didn't touch on earlier, but ends up being very important is when I described and we talked about the Americans walking, the, the American couple walking past Taylor as she entered the trail not long after they saw her, they're they're walking out of the trail, and as they did so, they saw two coyotes step out into the trail in front of them and just march towards them. And they were kind of surprised that these coyotes were so bold to come right on the trail, and the two Americans even stepped off the trail to let the coyotes walk past. And as they did, they snapped a photograph like of the coyotes just kind of walking boldly without fear past them. Um, and, and I have that picture. I'm, I'm going to put it up, a link to it in the show notes. And you can see a picture of these actual coyotes that was taken by the American couple. And they, they didn't, the Americans, they, they weren't scared of this, these coyotes. They were just more yeah. surprised that, <laughs> that they were bold enough to come. And this ends up becoming a big kind of tip and lead in the investigation. And that's what I found uh, surprising that, again, like if, if I was walking a trail and even before this, if I saw, you know, a coyote and especially if I saw two coyotes, I, you know, even before this, I would have been super concerned ab ab about being so close to them because like the picture that you see normally you can only get a picture like that from a great distance of a coyote it's 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 pretty rare to be able to be that close to a, a coyote to get it snap a picture absolutely like without like a big long zoom lens or anything this is they have like a regular point and click lens a camera and it's like a portrait of the coyotes it's like the coyotes are right in front of them and that is rare usually in cape breton like we there's a lot of coyotes there but you don't often see them you may hear them howling and making noise in the woods or whatever but it's they're not the kind of animals that will you know come anywhere near a human no is kind of, is, is is the general behavior of them but these coyotes they looked healthy so they weren't these sickly little ill animals like they looked big healthy animals they looked strong they definitely were bold and weren't afraid of humans as evidenced by them you know marching marching past these um these americans but that photo was surprising to to the researchers mainly because it showed you know how bold they were and, and that's kind of started setting off the the investigation into coyote behavior in this area now one thing that's generally true about coyotes is the way they hunt is they're like an individual hunter like one coyote will hunt a rabbit or a mouse or a rat unlike a wolf where a wolf will hunt in a pack mm -hmm. and you know a, a pack of wolves will take down a deer or a moose or something like that so generally the coyotes hunt the smaller prey wolves larger prey but what the thing in, in Cape Breton is somehow throughout history, before coyotes ended up in Cape Breton, somewhere along the way, they bred with wolves. And the coyotes we have in Cape Breton are slightly larger than the regular coyotes in, in the United States. But also the coyotes that we have are willing to hunt in packs, although they don't always do it. It's just they're they're very adaptable and they can hunt all different ways, but they will hunt in a pack. And when they saw the injuries to Taylor and the size of the one coyote that was seen near her, near her, the, the theory was that there must have been 
more coyotes involved, as well as coyotes are very quick to imitate other members of their of their pack. So basically, if one coyote is is very aggressive towards humans, the other coyotes in his family are likely to take on that behavior. So what they decided to do was hunt down the coyote responsible for Taylor's attack, the one that was shot by the police officer and likely survived it. But they also wanted to take down the other coyotes in, in his pack. So that set off a bit of a hunt involving traps and people going through the woods, I believe in helicopters, trying to find coyotes in this area to try to take them down and, and figure out which coyotes were responsible for it and, you know, and investigate further. Did you get much into what they, what they found? Um, yeah, like they, how, how many coyotes did they end up killing? Like seven, I think, uh, seven coyotes yeah. in the area, um, like around a five kilometer kind of, uh, uh, radius, I guess that must've been yeah. quite a thing to be able to do. Like, I can't imagine, you know, a needle in a haystack, or maybe it isn't, maybe I'm just ignorant to it, but I, I would think that would mm. be a challenging thing for them to be able to, to find the actual coyotes responsible. Especially like five kilometers. That's a, that's a big range. And when you're talking about, you know, like in a city, if there was like, you know, some animals in there, that's one thing, but out in the highlands of Cape Breton, that is thick forest and that yeah that's a big area and it would be pretty hard to find seven coyotes but but that's what they they managed to take down is is seven and i'm not sure if they were all part of the same uh pack or anything but um uh, I, I think just since they were in the same kind of area it was thought that they they must have been but they they got it right because they were expecting to take down the one coyote scene standing over taylor and being responsible for it as well as you know that coyote the other members of its pack but what they learned when they took the the bodies of the seven coyotes and and did whatever they do to look inside the coyotes they learned that it was actually three of them three were of them, yeah. involved in the attack although you know that wasn't known at the time it was suspected because the photograph that i mentioned showed two coyotes right the one yeah so one of the coyotes that was taken of the seven had the shotgun pellets in it. So that was obviously the one standing over Taylor. Yes. And it also had unique markings on its legs, just the way its uh, its hair was on its legs. It matched the one of the coyotes in the photograph taken by yes. the American. So they knew that the that that coyote marching past the Americans was eventually did go on to attack Taylor. Um another one of the seven coyotes had human remains uh in its digestive system yes and the th and that which is just horrible to think of and oh absolutely the, yeah and then the third one i i couldn't tell exactly what they were saying by this but it had markings or wounds that connected it to the scene so all i can think of is like since taylor had dropped like her keys in a pocket knife maybe she managed to fight back and maybe they found some kind of injury like maybe there was a puncture wound from a key in this coyote or something but maybe yeah i thought about too maybe it's teeth like maybe from markings on the body connecting it to the teeth or something i don't know uh, yeah i never i never thought of that but just my mind went to like um where she dropped her keys in that pocket knife i can only imagine that they, that she had, she tried to defend herself, but who knows? It could have just been in the course of running, they may have fallen out of her pocket or something. But yeah, I guess it, it's irrelevant because it's, you know, three of them at least were involved in an attack against her, which really shows that, you know, this wasn't one coyote attacked her. It was, you know, she had to fight off a pack and unsuccessfully. So, um, you know, to consider more into the, the behavior of the coyotes, the, one with the shotgun blast that was found standing over her. That was a male thought to be the alpha male, the leader of the pack. And the one that had the human remains in its belly, which was also was, they believe was the one also captured in the photo along with, with the original or the first coyote we mentioned was thought to be the alpha female. So the, the alpha male and female of the pack would be the, the coyotes responsible for capturing meals to bring back to the family so it's kind of it paints a picture of these two coyotes on the trail 
conducting a hunt. Um, and that's what it looks like had happened is this was a, a very intentional, although bizarre and unusual, it seems like it's exactly as bad as it looks. And you wonder, too, in that picture, which was taken before the attack, you know, this is two of them kind of in the area. Like, I wonder what exactly those two are up to at that point in time. Like, are they, do they already have, does the other one already have Taylor in their sights? Or how, I wonder how that all worked out. Hmm. Well, the way I picture it is these two coyotes see this American couple and maybe two large adults were just too much to take on or maybe they just stepped out of the way of the coyotes and the coyotes just kind of marched past an idea of this kind of perfect storm happening is when if these coyotes approach taylor maybe she got startled and ran which would right. have signaled the coyotes to you know to turn it on and attack right and that's, that's that's one thing that like after this happened um you really saw a lot of signs go up, a lot of signage um, of what to do in a, if, if a coyote approaches you mm -hmm. after this happened. I noticed it. Um, there may have been some before, but there was definitely a, a massive campaign after this to get signage everywhere to make sure that you carry a stick with you and make sure to not run. And make sure to stand there and look as big as possible, make as much noise as possible. Yeah, like raise your arms and scream and just basically try to intimidate the coyotes. Similar to a bear attack kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And her running would have totally triggered their instinct to, to chase after her and yep. and then uh, go ahead with the attack. Yeah, and that's that's the, the best theory laid forth by experts is that she was – walking alone, encountered by, you know, two or more coyotes that were not intimidated by her. The coyotes may have done something to signal aggression. I can almost picture her, you know, uh, maybe trying to calm them like, uh, like you would, like if an aggressive dog came near you or something. But maybe the coyotes showed some sign of aggression, which triggered her instincts to take off running, which triggered their instincts to, you know, to kill and capture basically is that's the the best theory as to as to what happened here but it kind of in reading about this and the behavior of coyotes it really shows the complicated relationship we have with them as well as the complicated environment that a national park or like a nature trail presents where coyotes generally don't connect with humans closely they may live near us but they stay far away in the woods or whatnot if we create these walking trails through their area it's putting us in their world a little bit but as well as what's interesting is on a nature trail people aren't hunting they're just you know walking and taking pictures so over time that will kind of signal to the coyotes or to the animals that humans aren't a threat and coyotes are really smart and they learn quick so when they learn that humans aren't a threat and they're not a species to be afraid of that may slowly make them a bit more bold but also coyotes they're smart enough to take the path of least resistance so if you cut a trail a walking trail through a forest the coyote is going to abandon his route uh, in between the trees and through the bushes and all this stuff. And he's just going to walk on the same trail that you or I would take. So it kind of creates the scenario where we're in their area. We're putting a trail where we're going to meet them face to face. And over time, we're going to convince them that we're not a threat. So it's almost like setting up this scenario, this environment where something like this can happen. And I'm not saying do away with nature trails, but I'm just saying that, you know, things like this, I think I'm almost surprised it's as rare as it is. Yeah. And that was surprised um, just that this was other than the, the, the small child that time was the, the only adult um, human ever, ever killed by, or the first, you know, um, ever killed by coyotes. And yeah. In, in documented history. Like in documented no... history. Yeah. Yeah, so there's – but that goes back – like when you're talking about documented history, you're talking about a good amount of time. And, you know, uh, someone getting killed by coyotes is going to make the paper. So this is truly a, a bizarre story. And it's 
it'd be tragic regardless, but I feel like it's made all the more tragic by having it be this young person who is just at the cusp of pursuing their dreams. Like she, like we've been there touring in a band and, you know, playing shows and things going well and just, you know, things are going your way. She, I, I could only imagine she was so high on life and was probably going on this trail, you know, to find inspiration so she could blow people's minds at her concert the next day in Sydney. And just to have, you know, fortune turn itself on her like this is just pretty depressing. It is depressing because you think she's she's out there doing the things she loves in terms of she's on tour uh, performing music and she's going to uh, a beautiful nature trail uh, to enjoy her second love which is animals and and nature and and the outdoors and it, and it all just turns on her and it's 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 crazy to think about it mm -hmm. it it is and it's forever connected her name with with this tragedy and I think that's something. Like I, I would never try to speak to speak for her family or any of her loved ones, but when you search Taylor's name, you'll find her music on the internet. But you're going to find countless articles about the horrific way she died, and I can't imagine that anyone wants to be remembered for this this tragic end. And also beyond that is you had mentioned this earlier is after her death it kind of created a lot of fear towards coyotes and it led to the death of countless coyotes. Not only were the seven involved in this event put to death, but there was, you know, hunters were taking down coyotes and it, they were just being, uh, many of them were killed. And Taylor is known as someone with just like a love for nature and a love for animals. And her mother, this is hard to even talk through, but t shortly after her death, Taylor's mother wrote a letter to, I believe it was published in the Globe and Mail, but it was published in a major Canadian newspaper where she basically is thanking the public for, you know, their support and, and, and whatnot for, you know, reaching out to her and writing online, you know, commemorating Taylor's life. But in the in the letter, she mentions that Taylor would never want the animals responsible to be killed or any other animals to be killed as a result of this. And to just put yourself in that headspace that her mother would be in losing her daughter and still to be able to think about, you know, she wouldn't want the animals to be killed as a result of this. That's just, I don't know why, but that for me is really heavy. And it's because she also mentions about, how we're on their territory. Like when we're going into this national park, this is where the coyotes live. And she said that, you know, Taylor would have understood that. I remember when uh, the hunting of coyotes was happening after this and it was increasing and it was, and the volume was really being turned up on, on fear against coyotes. Um, I remember her mother coming out and saying that, you know, this is not something Taylor would have wanted and was, you know, trying to make people think differently about the coyotes than how they were fearing uh, after this event. And, you know, and I think about that a lot too. Like if you're out swimming in the ocean and if you're attacked by a shark, you know, you read about areas where there's maybe a shark attack. Um, and then all of a sudden, uh, you know, everybody goes on a shark hunt and is trying to, you know, capture or kill Sharks in the area. You see it in the movie Jaws. Is there's the famous scene <laughs> yeah. where I was going to say you're talking about Jaws. Yeah, I'm always I'm often talking about Jaws, but um, yeah, like and everybody is out trying to trying to hunt all these sharks, and then but then you think about it, it's like you know when you're swimming in the ocean, you are kind of in the shark's territory, and this is that's what a shark does. It kind of sniffs around for food and you know it may take a bite or something and swim away or it, it may not but um that's kind of the risk that you take uh when you're going into the ocean yeah uh, taylor's mother here's how she one of the quotes from from her letter she says we take a calculated risk when spending time in nature's fold it's the wildlife's train when the decision had been made to kill the pack of coyotes i clearly heard taylor's voice say please don't this is their space she wouldn't have wanted their demise, especially as a result of her own. 
She was passionate about animals, was an environmentalist, and was also planning to volunteer at the Toronto Wildlife Centre in the coming months. So that's just, that's, that's powerful to be able to, in the face of the loss of your daughter, to be able to, to say that. And yeah, I don't know. It's, uh, I can never, I could never put myself in her position, but I feel like my response would be like, I want every coyote on this planet destroyed. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> like, I feel like I would turn to the dark side. Immediately. Yeah. I, I, I kind of hope that I would land in the same response as, as Taylor's mother, because I, I do kind of believe that notion of, you know, uh, the animals, you know, that's their space. And when you're, you know, there's always that small risk that you're taking mm -hmm. when, when you're going out in, into the deep woods or you're, or you're swimming in the ocean or whatever it is, um, you know, that's, that's their territory. And yeah. I, I get that. Like, I get your, your point and, and like, I feel that way from my present situation, but I feel like if I was pushed the way Taylor's loved ones would have been, I just don't know if I'd be able to have that perspective. Like, I feel like I would just be so filled with just, I don't know. I, I just feel like I would just feel rage. But right. I, I think it comes from there, which sounds like they have a really um, extensive background in, in um, the outdoors and animals. And it seems like they have a really strong understanding mm -hmm. of, of that. And I think because they seem educated in that area that, and that that's what, where they would naturally go um, mm -hmm. to understand that, uh, you know, this isn't a, a cut and dry situation of, of evil coyotes. It's, it, this is kind of nature kind of uh, occurring around us. And sometimes, um, unfortunately will fall victim to that sometimes. Yeah. It's, it's a tragic story. It's a freak occurrence. Um, and I think in, in the end, what people, not that I try to have these episodes have any kind of message, but I guess the message for this episode would be check out Taylor's music to see what she was so passionate about and what she dedicated so much of herself to. And also have respect for, for nature and animals yet be prepared. Like, I think, yeah, like I can understand why she went alone, but I think, um, I don't think going even to a trail that's not dangerous and too rustic. Like I, I just don't think going on a trail alone is, is a smart thing to do. Yeah. And it's reminded us of, of, of that danger and it, and you can see a big difference now when you go on a trail like most people carry sticks with them and the signage is all over the place informing you of what to do. So I think people are now more educated about it. And when they are going hiking, uh, they're more prepared. Yeah. People locally, but I'm thinking if I went to the skyline trail this summer, I bet you I would find some tourists from somewhere else that didn't know about this event that are, you know, out for a jog alone with their headphones on running down the trail alone. Like, I just think when you're going into the woods, you just, it's unpredictable that, which is what makes it amazing. Like when you're going out, like at a spot, like the skyline trail, you're going into nature, you see the beauty, you may encounter, you know, a, a herd of deer or whatever, or you may get a view of the water and see an, a whale. But at the same time, you could see some of the darkness that exists in nature too so it's yeah it's it kind of all goes together as a big complicated unpredictable package and the best we can do is be prepared i suppose and right. yeah i want to thank you for joining aaron and i in our discussion surrounding the life and the tragic death of taylor mitchell this episode was a tough one to research and put together the story of a young and passionate artist at the beginning of their life is something we all get excited about. But to talk through it ending so suddenly, so tragically, and so horrifically, that part's hard. And with that, we'll end this episode of Nighttime. But before we part, I want to end with some thanks. First, a huge thank you to Aaron Corbett for again serving as the Nighttime co-host. Aaron, we're lucky to have you here. Also, a big thanks to Paragon Cause for providing this episode's musical theme. And lastly, but most importantly, a huge thank you to the listeners of Nighttime. 
Without you, this show would have seen the light of day many moons ago. And with that said, if you want more nighttime, for about the price of a cup of coffee, you can access a separate feed where the episodes are posted a few days earlier than in the free feed and without advertising. But beyond the regular episodes, the premium feed also includes the popular Nightcap After Show, in which I and a guest climb a bit further down the rabbit hole. You can access the premium feed at patreon.com slash nighttime podcast. And with that said, I want to thank the newest members to the group. Stephanie H. and Virginia B., thank you for subscribing to the premium feed. And for anyone else out there who'd like to support the show but can't help financially, you can give me a big hand by telling your friends about me and by leaving a positive review on Apple Podcasts or whichever equivalent you use. If any of you listening want to stay up to date with my activities on or off the show, follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I use the handle at NighttimePod. If you have any story ideas or would like to give feedback on the show, I'd love to hear from you at NighttimePodcast at gmail.com. Now until next time, take care of each other, hug your loved ones tight, and stay safe out there. The Nighttime Podcast is written, hosted, and produced by Jordan Bonaparte. Copyright Jordan Bonaparte. Well, I met my producer, Michael Johnston, uh, about three years ago, I guess, and we started talking about songwriting, and he got me to bring in and show him a few of my songs and said, you know, I think this is something you should seriously consider. And I loved that idea, and we started uh, just writing and talking about where we wanted this to go and what direction, and I made a four-song EP about a year and a half ago, uh, showcased at a couple music conferences, uh, gained enough momentum that I now went in to made the studio, make the studio album and uh, hired some incredible session musicians who are all veterans in the industry and came out with a really great product that I'm really happy with.